Testosterone. What a great subject. Uh, testosterone. It's the hormone that divides us. Now, this might, this might be a controversial statement today. It wasn't that long ago. But did you know that men and women are biologically different um, and behaviorally different? And there's a biological root to all of this. Now, of course, there are societal pressure pressures and cultural pressures that make us behave a particular way. But there are biological ones as well. This is not contested in science. Uh, and in today's episode, we interview someone that talks all about this, wrote an amazing episode. You're going to love this episode. By the way, here's our giveaway. I know that's why you're tuning in to watch the intro. You want to know what you can win for free. I get it. Here you go. Maps Aesthetic. That's what we're going to give away for free in today's episode. Here's how you can win free access to Maps Aesthetic. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours. Give us your thoughts on the episode. Make it a compelling comment. If we like your comment, we'll notify you, and then you get free access to Maps Aesthetic. By the way, you also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing. We're running a 50% off sale promotion on two very popular programs, Maps Strong and Maps Powerlift, both half off. Go check them out or go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for the discount. All right, enjoy the show. So, Carol, thanks for coming on. Um, I'd like for you to give our audience a little bit of background to yourself, and then I'd like you to go into why you studied and wrote a book on testosterone, of all things. Great. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's mm -hmm. a thrill to be here and meet all of you. Um, as far as background, how far back do you want me to go? I can talk about not being the ideal student in high school. Maybe some of your listeners could relate to that. Yeah, and sure. Sort of, <laughs> um, so I like to talk about where I came from because I think it's important for people to know that just because you weren't a stellar student early on, uh, that doesn't mean that you can't change direction and kind of try to sort things out and get to where you're meant to be or where you, you know, have to work hard to go, but you can work hard and focus and change things. And so uh, in high school, I was pretty crazy. I Yes, I was definitely pretty crazy. So all my great high school friends who are helping me now on Facebook and stuff and supporting the book know exactly where I came from. And that is somebody who skipped so many classes that I didn't have a diploma in my folder when I graduated. And so I was not a star student like almost all of my Harvard students. So it feels weird to be there teaching them when I came from such a different place. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I eventually, I did get into a great college, but it was a, a different college, Antioch College, which I loved. And then um, that's when I started to become curious about the um, ways that biology shapes our behavior. And so that just kind of planted the seed. And then it took 10 years for me just having a job and software and kind of trying to get my shit together and, you know, just have an apartment, have a job, just have a life. And I did a lot of traveling and reading. And that's how long it took me to figure out that I really wanted to go to graduate school and study the evolutionary basis of human behavior. And I didn't really have a super strong focus at that point. Um, so I ended up, I read a couple books. One um, is The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins about how um, genes and evolution motivate behavior. And then I read another one by somebody named Richard Wrangham, which was about trying to uh, focused on trying to understand human aggression using, using an evolutionary perspective. And he had a field site in Uganda where he studied wild chimpanzees. So I read that book, quit my job and applied to Harvard wow. because uh, to grad school, because I wanted to work with him. And I got rejected <laughs> because I had no relevant experience. And, uh, but I had already quit my job. So I was like, you know what? This is what I'm doing. I'm not giving up. And uh, so after I got rejected, I went up to meet with him and a few other people in the department, which at the time was biological anthropology. And they you know, said, you have to get experience. And so I was like, all right, give me, give me some experience. This is what I'm doing. How, how do I do, what, do, what can I do? So I just kept kind of um, pushing and I just really didn't give up on that goal. And ultimately Richard offered me a job getting some research experience and running the field site, the chimpanzee research field site in Uganda for a year. So that was thrilling. Um, my friends and family were very nervous about it because 
this was a very tumultuous time in the region of Africa that I was in. There was um, a couple civil wars going on. There were a lot of people being attacked with machetes. And there was also like a huge number of um, rapes and murders. And uh, so it was a little bit tricky. Uh, but I, I went out there and um, got to watch chimps and you know learn about chimpanzee behavior and how to research it and so that was what really got me interested in testosterone because if you are somebody anybody who spent time with chimpanzees in the wild um notices right off the bat that there are massive sex differences that in a lot of ways parallel what we see in humans so you know you've probably seen videos or maybe you've seen in person um adult male chimpanzees sort of going on what look like rampages, you know, mm -hmm. and it, like doing these threatening displays and beating up some females and definitely competing for status and beating up other males potentially. So there's a huge obsession with status. There's a lot more physical aggression than you would see in the females who really on average are just put on average before everything I say, um, are, you know, much more peaceful although they are capable of also um, being very physically aggressive, but I didn't see any uh, really extreme female aggression at all, just some very, very low levels. But the males regularly, the adult males every day are doing uh, some something physically aggressive, getting into physical fights, uh, you know, running around screaming and dragging big branches and you know even beating their chests and trying to threaten uh other males they can also be really you know loving and nurturing and friendly too but it's just the differences in the male and female behavior were so striking you know and the females are with their families and they tend to be very nurturing so given there's no culture uh human culture that is among wild animals you know the obvious explanation for the parallels between their sex differences and our sex differences is biology, is genes, and ultimately testosterone. So that's the most potent biological factor that can explain why the sexes behave so differently, especially when there's no human culture saying, okay, men- You have to be this way. Or... Exactly. Yeah. Were, there so assumptions, the were there assumptions that you went into when you, when you started to- uh, watch these chimpanzees or did you go in completely open-minded and if so what were the what was the craziest things that you noticed about them <sighs> yeah no I had no I was pretty you know I read a bunch of books but I really didn't know a lot about sex differences or testosterone even I wasn't really sure what it was or <laughs> was sort of embarrassing to say now but or um, what it did so I really had no con preconceived notions. I just wanted to understand human behavior and where it came from and, you know, how we evolved and how our own biology shapes our behavior. Now, is it safe? Would you, would you say this is a uh, safe to say that the, the differences in sexes in chimpanzees, although there are parallels uh, between chimpanzees and humans, they're much more pronounced or extreme? Yes. Okay. Yes. And thank you for saying that because that's really, really important. Um, they're definitely much more pronounced. Human males are nowhere near as violent as male chimpanzees. Like we can, um, one example that people sometimes use is, you know, I took, I just took a plane from Boston and there were a bunch of strange adult human males together on the plane, not beating the crap out of each other. Like mm. that would never, never happen in chimps. You know, if you meet a chimp from, um, a different community and, and you're an adult male, there's going to be a fight there. That's just not mm. tolerated. There's a high levels of physical aggression in a way, in the way we don't see it humans. And one thing we have to, uh, keep in mind is that humans are weird mammals, obviously because of our culture, but also because you guys, I don't know if any of you have kids. Oh, we all, we're all fathers. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, that, so that's great. So you know that you are probably, you can feel yourself capable of extreme aggression, of particularly mm -hmm. someone messes with your mate or your child. Absolutely. Um, but it, on the, you know, the flip side of that is you're capable of probably, I'm going to start <laughs> crying. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> a level of, because it's so beautiful to see, it was beautiful to see in my husband, a level of nurturing that you never expected. And what's amazing is that 
that kicks in when you're exposed to your the the stimulus that or the stimuli that are your offspring that kicks in just like it does in male birds. Now, do you think that's naturally, or do you think that's kind of been nurtured into us over? Totally a- natural. Okay. I th- it's totally. I be- I think that that is natural. I don't see the evidence that anyone's telling you to be aggressive or to be. Um, I mean, certainly there are social pressures, but you feel that from so deep down in you, and it's it's coming out because you have a child and you're going to increase your reproductive success if you're nurturing and bonded and, and protected and protecting your offspring and your partner, you yes. know, and, and no other man can come near <laughs> your partner. So you probably, I mean, sexually, obviously, so sorry to even plant that seed in your head right now, but um, so you probably feel at the same time, you know, physically protective, but also incredibly nurturing and responsible yeah. for the safety and well-being yeah. would this kid. also be a, so a, chimps don't have that so that so right. i just wanted to just sorry complete that circle is that chimps don't have that most mammals 95 percent of mammals the males have nothing to do with their kids it's all about status and sex basically I was, finding me i was just gonna so s- that incre- that amps up the male male competition i was just gonna say because uh, and this is to, i love this this is a topic i'm so into obviously nowhere near your expertise at all oh i'm sure i i think you probably are you, but <laughs> i but I, I do You're love this. I read a lot about this, and yeah. h- human males are remarkably uh, paternal in comparison yeah. to all other mammals or males. Where the males often will kill their young if they lo- don't look like them or are extremely aggressive. Like we're pretty, pretty damn good as uh, you know, as as a parent in comparison to others. Um, yeah. But there is a difference, right? There is yeah. still a general difference between men and women in that. So. This study of chimpanzees really sparked your interest in, of all things, or of all drivers, testosterone. Now, why was it testosterone? Uh, uh, beside, you know, why not estrogen or other drivers? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, and yeah, to be honest, it's because the I loved being with the females partly because it was just so beautiful to mm. sort of the the peacefulness and the nurturing and it's quiet and you know you can just hear the birds and and the insects and she'd just be there and the little little you know they're so cute the little chimp um babies and juveniles are just adorable and you can just sit there in the jungle and watch you know them play and twist around on the branches and cuddle with their moms and that's wonderful however <laughs> when you're with the males, um, it's just a whole different ball game, and it's really exciting. And I liked watching the males because you never knew what was going to happen, and it was going to be exciting, kind of like, oh my god, you know, there's so much activity and screaming and beatings and sex, and that's testosterone. So yes, there are some incredible, mostly women primatologists who focus on females and estrogen. That's just not what I was drawn to. I mm. grew up with three bro- three older brothers. Um, I was a pretty, I think I, I, think I am, or, or, and I was kind of on the masculine side as a kid. Like I, I played baseball. I, I, you know, was just really um, more boyish in some ways. And I don't know, I, I think I just, also, you know, just my sort of experiences in, high school and college and sort of having some bad interactions with men when you know like staying all night out all night at parties and stuff which just was stupid from a lot of points of view i think just got me as a woman like i get females right Mm. in a way that i didn't get men and Mm. i think that i just was driven to understand that so that is what drew me to testosterone. Okay. So here's a question I've been wanting to ask you because I, I, I heard you on uh, Joe Rogan. This is why we we called because I thought it was so fascinating what you wrote back uh, wrote about. Um, and I did read a lot of your book. And he, here's something that's very interesting and I want to ask you about. So when we're in utero, um, we're essentially, we look the same until our genes tell us to get this injection of testosterone. And then there's this traumatic change in the fetus. But before that, I mean, they're almost identical. Unless you go and see, look at their chromosomes, you can't tell the difference. But then testosterone comes in and we get this huge influx of testosterone and it changes the fetus into this, uh, into a male. From your standpoint, from what you've read, what are the evolutionary I guess, drivers or advantages? Like, why does this even exist? Why have this hormone 
that changes our behaviors so much? What is it? What are the advantages? Yeah. To, and what were the advantages? And do these advantages still exist? Do we still need them? Okay, you're gonna have to remind me all the different questions no in there because I, I want to get to all of them. So I want to start out with what happens in utero and us um, basically being the same. Mm -hmm. So the male and female thing is determined when. If there is a first, obviously, you know, most people already know this, but if there is a Y chromosome, mm -hmm. almost always there are exceptions to this. So the chrome, I just want to say also that the chromosomes themselves do not define sex. So people get confused. They think that XX equals female and XY equals male. That's not always true. And that's definitely, you know, generally true in mammals, but certainly that's not the case in other taxa like birds or amphibians. Okay. There's, you know, different um, chromosomal arrangements. So the second thing is it is the action of the SRY gene, the sex determining region of the Y chromosome, um, which is a specific gene that produces a protein. Um, and that protein is what's called a transcription factor. So that protein in the cells, in the there's an undifferentiated gonad up until about six weeks. So it could become an over, it could become ovaries, or it could become um, testicles. Mm. So if that gene is present, it produces this protein SRY, and that protein goes around to all the different chromosomes basically and upregulates other genes that produce other proteins that cause the cells in those undifferentiated gonads to go in the testicle direction. Got it. So you can have the Y chromosome, but if that gene isn't working or any of the important downstream genes that need to be upregulated aren't working, there's one called like SOX9 that it upregulates um, on chromosome 17. So say there's a mutation in SOX9 on chromosome 17, then even if you have SRY, even if you have the Y chromosome and SRY, you still won't get testes. You will get ovaries because ovaries the undifferentiated gonads go in the ovaries direction in the absence of SRY. Interesting. So they have to be told to become yes, testicles. Otherwise right. they remain, or that's the default ovaries. That is correct. Okay. So that is why some people say female is the default. In a sense, that's true. It's not quite that simple. Of course, there are other genes that have to be expressed, but they're going to be expressed in the absence of SRY. Got it. So that is the first way that we differentiate is not by testosterone, actually, it's by the action of this SRY gene. But then once, you know, after six weeks, once the um, gonads differentiate into testes. So re real quick, yeah. with, in the absence of testosterone, let's say the genes get differentiated, you get this protein that signals become testicles. But no testosterone later on comes into the body. Yes. You still get testicles. Yes. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yes. So that is what happens essentially in the case of complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Interesting. You get te your, your XY, you have testes, everything's going fine, but your androgen receptor is has a mutation. The gene that codes for the androgen receptor wow. has a mutation. Okay. If it has a, a disabling mutation, you pr your testes produce testosterone, but it can't be heard by the body at all. So you have a completely female phenotype, 100% female. I mean, you don't have all of the internal reproductive organs. There's no uterus, but there's a you know totally normal vagina, totally normal vagina that is a what's called a blind vagina that doesn't connect to interesting a uterus. But yes, yeah, so you can have testes, but without testosterone, you do not develop a male phenotype in terms of the internal and external genitalia, in terms of secondary sex characteristics, in terms of brain masculinization. So once you get the testes, then a couple of weeks later, those cells, um, specifically the Leydig cells, start cranking out testosterone. And that is what, what then is, it's also a transcription factor. So it also goes around to other chromosomes and up regulates other genes that cause the development of a penis and of the vas deferens and starts to masculinize the brain. Now, what is that? So you're talking about masculinizing <laughs> the brain. I saw an article recently that made its rounds. It said, essentially male and female brains are the same. It's funny because you dive in a little deeper into the study and they really kind of cut out differences and said those don't, you know, those really aren't big differences. Although... From my, from what I understand, if you took two brains and you took two very, you know, smart biologists, they could probably tell you if one was male or one was female. What do you mean by masculinizing the brain? What what changes in the brain that makes it male? 
Yeah. So I wouldn't say so clearly that um, testosterone makes it male. Um, I think the a, a male level of testosterone will generally will masculinize the brain in ways that are detectable in behavior, and that yes, okay. an expert a computer program from what i understand would be is able to differentiate male and female brains with something like 80 to 90% accuracy so cuz the issue is that there are lots of differences but they are they're widespread and they're a high number of them but they're not as pronounced as they are non-human animals, so where, where an expert could just go, that's a male and that's a female. So you have to add them all up cumulatively. That's right. So like you're a face. talking to the like function of the brain versus not just like the physical. Yes. Yeah, so it's, yes. I mean, so what testosterone, what we know from non-human animals, and we there's indirect evidence in humans that this is also, also the case, is that testosterone acts in the brain to change the populations of um, neurons in different parts of the brain. It definitely, in non-human animals and apparently in humans, acts on an area in the hypothalamus, um, which is called the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the, hi of the um, hypothalamus. And that area, testosterone causes that area of the hypothalamus to enlarge or actually um, prevents the death of neuron populations in that um, part of the brain. Oh, interesting. Brain. So the female brain prunes it, whereas the male brain, yeah, the I, masculinized I have, brain. I'm not 100% sure if that's due to increased growth or due to pruning, but te one of testosterone's um, most pronounced actions is to prevent apoptosis of or, or cell death of uh, neurons in certain parts of the brain. What do we know hmm. that that part of the brain, what do we know in sex. terms of... So, okay. Sex. So like like sexual sexual Id identification. Or no, sexual well that's drive? interesting because they don't. There so sexually sexual identification in non-human animals isn't really a thing except for a couple species, except for like sheep. You know, there are some mm. gay sheep, but otherwise there's, as far as I know, there aren't any instances of exclusively gay animals. There's lots of homosexual behavior, like I saw it in chimps all the time. They would be basically blowing each other. Or <laughs> wow. <laughs> sorry, can I say that? Yes, you can say whatever you want. We're going to pop that video up real quick. <laughs> so, <laughs> no problem. You know, bonobos are on like that, Andrew. T tons of, of homosexual behavior. Yeah. Chimps have, you know, um, male, male bonding will frequently involve uh, sexual behavior. So, but that doesn't mean that they're homosexual. You know, humans have these categories, which is interesting. And I think a lot of that does have to do with culture, the exclusive homosexuality. But anyway, that so testosterone increases the size somehow of the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, the SDNPOA. And in order for the male to express male typical sexual behavior. So in a rat, that's mounting. And what's cool is you have this, you know, um, extreme differences in sexual behavior, not like you do in humans, where we can, you know, men and women can do a bunch of different crazy mm -hmm. things. But in rats the male ha you know pursues and mounts the female and the female has to stand still and um, basically stick her butt like arch her back and stick her butt up in the air that's lordosis mm -hmm. so estrogen so no testosterone in her brain in utero plus estrogen in adulthood activates that behavior in the presence of a sexually interested adult male and he will only uh, engage in mounting behavior if he had high testosterone in utero if his sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area is big, and if he gets testosterone in adulthood. Interesting. So that's the organizational activational framework, which apparently also applies to mm. human males. Now, you need it at both times. You need it in utero and in adulthood to be have male typical reproductive behavior. You brought up apoptosis and, yeah. and like cell protective, sort of like that being more of a focus in the male brain like do you think that's more you know geared towards like the risky behavior part of that with males you know as far as like a mechanism uh, for survival yeah. yeah so the masculinization of the brain in utero does seem to be associated um it's definitely associated in non-human animals with aggression and rough and tumble plan little kids and juvenile animals so lots of juvenile animals the males 
have much more physical play than the females, just like we see in humans. Like everyone knows that happens in humans, mm -hmm. but a lot of people try to argue that this happens in humans because of like the patriarchy or socialization. Right. That's just not the case. There's just way too much evidence. And I can happy to talk about any of that evidence, but it is testosterone exposure in non-human animals that causes them to um, in the right environment, you know, have these high levels of rough and tumble play because they have to practice to compete for mates physically mm. as adults because that's how evolution shapes them. And we have evidence from humans. Um, so first of all, we have the sex difference where, you know, males are exposed to high levels of testosterone and they have much higher rates of rough and tumble play and obviously physical aggression in adulthood. Um, but also we have cases where um, girls, so female fetuses, are exposed to unusually high levels of testosterone in utero, and they have higher rates than average um, of rough and tumble play, and they're more likely to want to play with um, boys and more likely to want to play with boys' toys. So we know, and they're more likely to be lesbians, too. Mm. Um, mm. So we can see those effects in girls. And part of the reason is that females are super sensitive to um, increases in testosterone. Oh, yeah. Whereas if you have males with the same disorder, which is called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, there's really no effect on behavior because males already have so much that when you add more to that, and this is true in adults too, um, except for muscle development, as you guys probably know, when you add more, it doesn't really have a big effect, if any, on like libido or aggression. But if you do that to females, you're going to see changes. Wow. Very interesting. You know, you mentioned the the culture aspect of it. And in my opinion, I think, I think obviously culture plays a role in how we act and how we think we're supposed to behave. But I do think culture follows biology. In other words, the roots of it you know, the roots of us believing that boys like rough and tumble and like to jump off things and girls tend. And of course, this is general. There's always exceptions. I think the roots of it are in biology. So we, we, we observe this through thousands of years and then we develop culture around it. How, how do you feel about it? Well, and then we try so, to deny that. Sorry, what? Oh, and I was going to say that a lot of times, like I, I see now too that in, in culture, we're trying to deny uh, yes. the fact that we are animals at the end of the day. Yes. And, and then culture has then, we, we've been trying to kind of move forward in this other yeah, isn't uh, there direction. A, isn't there a big movement right now of like not sexualizing your kid at all and not giving yes. them specific toys for a certain amount of time? So like yeah. in colors, that avoiding yeah. that, like. I have to just, I want to come back to all of this. First of all, you guys, I'm totally serious. You're so impressive. I'm. It's even making me like, look what's happening to me. No, what you just said is such a, um, I think it's such an important point and it's it's kind of a, it's a nuanced point. And a lot of people just, just assume that culture and patriarchy and the things that we teach boys, you know, it's just obvious, which is true that, yeah, we do. If you think a baby is a boy baby, you're going to be rougher with him or it, mm -hmm. even if it's a girl, if you think it's a boy, you're going to treat it differently. But the fact is, it's this, this, these sex differences are this way everywhere in the world. These natures, mm -hmm. you know, are different everywhere. And so you're answering the question of like, well, that would be weird if every single culture had the same kinds of standards yeah. and the same norms and the same expectations. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's coming from the bottom up and we're responding to it and shaping it and nudging it. And there's different cultural norms that definitely do shape how people are able to express their natures or allowed to express their mm -hmm. natures, right? But yeah, I think that's such, um, I think it is a sophisticated and important point that needs to be acknowledged. Like it's the same everywhere. It's just, and it's consistent yeah. with non-human animals. So I like to play this game. I don't want to take us off track, but I like to play this game of, uh, this is from evolution. I do this with my wife all the time and it annoys the hell out of her. <laughs> She's very intellectual. And so we get to do this and we have fun and, so here's a great example, right? Um, and this is a common stereotype, although I, every guy I know has gone the, through the, this. The hunting and gathering. Oh, yeah. Like, I'll go, I'll be like, honey, where are the pickles? And she'll be like, it's in the fridge. And I'll open the fridge, and I seriously don't see it. I'm like, they're not here. Where are they? They're right there. No, they're not. She'll walk over to the fridge, move four things, yeah. and it's right there. Yes. And, I, and I'm like- I can relate to that a hundred. Yeah. Oh, I know yeah. where everything is yeah. in the house. And I'm like, why didn't I move? And I work, I have a full-time job. I work my ass <laughs> off. I'm just as busy as my oh. husband. Why doesn't he know where anything Yeah, and is. so I'm like, why didn't I just move? And it happens all the time. And I thought, so here's my here's my explanation. And I made this up, by the way. There's no evidence to, to support this. But I said, you know what, honey? 
it's because men evolved as hunters. And when you're out in the wild, you don't want to disturb the environment. <laughs> so you just look, you just look. And if you don't oh, see it, it's not there. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 said, and women were gathering. Yeah, and you, you yeah, move things around yes, looking yes. for. Yeah. Very so aware was, of colors yeah. and <laughs> no, distinguishing no, that was my tongue and cheek There is evidence, actually. Oh, really? So, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> so... First of all, here's one area where we can't compare humans to non-human animals because we have this intense sexual division of labor. Mm. Chimps do actually have um, do hunt, and I got to see a few hunts, and that was amazing. They hunt monkeys, and, and that's and then they rip them to shreds and eat their wow. insides. Yeah. Um, so, so that's really cool. It's intense to see. It is intense, and they have first priority to the uh, um, for the meat to eat the meat, and then they can give it to um, whoever they want. But anyway. So, for my dissertation, which I did um, at Harvard, and I was in biological anthropology and cognitive um, neuropsychology at the time, um, so I was kind of bridging disciplines, but I looked at sex differences in cognition and how they relate to testosterone, and the biggest sex difference is something called mental rotation. So, that's the biggest sex difference in um cognitive ability so okay. most people have no idea what it is i had no idea what it was and i was like this is totally boring i don't want to do it who cares <laughs> however <laughs> i was trying to can i just tell us a little do it i'm gonna tell us a little story everyone's about intrigued it. okay yeah. <laughs> no so this is okay so um for my graduate work you kind of have to as a graduate student sometimes try different things and see what sticks or where you're going to get results or what you really like or what's feasible to do or whatever. So I wanted to see, there was some evidence that one could manipulate testosterone levels through um, pornography. And th so I had read one paper and I learned, I have since learned that one paper just isn't good enough. You need like a lot of work that's mm -hmm. replicated and there's where you have a robust finding. But so I saw I, one paper uh, showing that men's testosterone levels went up when they viewed pornography. And um, now I can't even remember. Okay, so I was going to try to get uh, local men baseball fans to come in. Sorry, I had so many different projects um, and now I'm getting confused. Forget about like, the baseball thing is a different story. Um, <laughs> so I had uh, local men come in. I was just going to manipulate their testosterone and then test them in some different cognitive tests. And my Manipulate advisor, through pornography. Through pornography to get it to go up and dental surgery videos to get it go, to go down. Wow. Right? So I was like, <laughs> what I'll a tough just, decision. Okay. So, <laughs> I guess yeah. go watch porn. That'll do it. And then they're going to mess with my No, teeth. they didn't know what they were going to be getting. Oh, okay. So they came twice and it was counterbalanced. So some men would come the first time and they got um, dental surgery and they didn't know that they were going to get pornography the second time. And then the guys who got porn the first time we get dental surgery the second time now i'm, I'm i can't even remember why i'm telling you this story there was oh, a, just a that's reason. okay with the fact that you're here I, I have something i want to ask you about this okay. we've oh, actually no, because discussed it's, this. it's the hunting and gathering yes, in the fridge yes, thing yes. okay mm -hmm. so this is i'm gonna connect so but what is funny about it is i had to there's something called the internal review board the irb so you can't do human subjects research in at a university unless you clear it with the IRB. And, mm -hmm. you know, so um, this woman, I won't say her name, she was the head of the IRB. I had to go to her office and watch the pornography with her <laughs> and it was lesbian porn that I was showing, wow. that I was showing the it's guys because, experience. <laughs> yeah, no, it was bizarre. And uh, as you can like imagine. Sure, um, I'm picturing it. <laughs> and, um, no, because we were very different. Like she was, you know, a dean, the, a dean type, yeah, yeah. and I was me, <laughs> and and much younger, and it was just weird. And um, yeah, we didn't include men. I didn't want to have pornography that had men in it because I didn't want the men to feel to have any um, comp competitive response to it. Oh, that's at all. a good point. So, what mm. and what you're referring to is uh, that there are studies that show that. When men yes. feel sexually competitive to another man, yes. it's you can reliably see testosterone levels mm. rise. Okay. It can happen, yeah. But anyway, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't work. And now I've since read other studies. It just that doesn't happen. Testosterone okay. does not go up while in sexual contexts unless it's competitive. Mm. Unless there's like a 
an attractive woman and you're trying to show off or you're competing with another guy in some way or whatever, then they're, um, James Roney has done this research. Um, but the point is, so I learned a lot about mental rotation and I learned that I just had to throw in the pornography thing. Cause I think it's I'm glad you actually funny. went there though, because we've actually theorized the opposite is true. So I told you before we got on air that one of the first conversations we had was the decline in testosterone in young right, men. Right. And one of the things that we theorize of, as a, the possibility oh, is, is watching too much pornography. The desensitization. Well, just having too much access to it. Oh, that you don't have to work for it. You don't have to compete right. for it. So you don't need the testosterone. And also that, that it just facilitate. normalizes. That is fascinating. It. Yeah, that yeah. was a theory that we have. No, I think that's interesting. I mean, of course, there's the theory about... Um, Phthalates, phthalates. Oh yeah, phthalates. yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of uh, yeah. reasons why people think testosterone levels are declining. But we, no, we, but that's interesting. Yeah, that was what we actually listed a bunch. We actually and did a just whole... using apps. You're yeah. Also using apps instead of real life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And just think about the amount of it yeah. that you're getting. Your uh, what we were talking about. We're all forty, right? So we were talking about man when we were a seventeen year old yeah. boy. You got the J.C. Penney Center catalog was all you got. Right. You know what I'm saying? And you <laughs> had to hide it. And you got to go to the beach. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know? got to look at it once a hard. month if you were lucky yeah. you know or maybe if your parents worked yeah. a lot maybe a couple times a week but boys now yeah. have access on their phone to oh just a plethora of I have this. a 12 year old boy so I'm very <laughs> sensitive yeah. to what he's he's what he will be encountering oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was one of yeah it's one a, of the theories nice. that we thought contributed to that. but now I want to make sure I say about the sexual division of labor and the evolution yes. thing so this thing, mental rotation, is a skill where you can imagine objects. Like if I hold this up, um, you could imagine what these, if I held it to the side and I turned it around, you could imagine what these letters maybe look like from the, if they were upside down, or what this bottle would look like upside down when you envision it and you rotate it through your mind. Instead of just regenerating the image, like upside down, you actually rotate it. Anyway, the test involves more complex objects than this. Men really blow away women consistently wow. everywhere on the really? This is yes. a test you can take huh. online. They'll, show, is, you, they'll yes. show you shapes and then they'll yeah. have like options. What does the shape look like from another angle? It, from like, if hmm. you were to twist it, you know, move it 180 degrees. Yes. And men do that significantly space. better than than women. Now here's a test. Every, yes, and it's it's so robust. It's it, it's a large. It is the largest sex difference in cognition. So what is the wow. what's Hunting. the evolu we, what's Hunting. okay? So the so the Object one hypothesis is that it is hunting, which I am skeptical about because so I just want to get back to the hunting thing because it's fascinating because what you said is right on. So when you're driving, say. You're gonna when you give when men give directions, they're more likely to say go east, south, north, west on this, this, and that street. Women are more likely to say turn left at the church, and then you'll see a big tree with blah blah blah, and there you're gonna mm -hmm. take a right. Mm -hmm. So there's like a dead reckoning that that men tend to use to get from A to B. Also, so if you're hunting, you are really not. You have to have a you're not sense. Not all of, other stuff. You're following your prey, yeah. right? So you have to have a sense of um, where you are geographically, and you have to be able to recognize the environment from a completely different perspective mm -hmm. because it's not the environment that you saw when you were going out. You know, you're going to see something different when you come back. Wow. Say so, so. So here's one I wanted to ask you about that. About since we're on this topic, I read that there's this test that they can run where they'll show just pictures of eyes, so yeah. just people's eyes. And women are able to much more accurately tell you what that person's facial expression is. So like happy, sad, yeah. afraid, you know, terrified, whatever. And men tend to fail that much more often. Is that yeah. a, is that true? That is true. Okay. Now, I would assume that, that, that the evolutionary roots of that would be because women were the society builders, right? They were the ones building the... The connections back at the you know at the tribe, and so they really had to understand how to read each other very well. Whereas the man, not so much, because we're out hunting. Would that be? I the mean, um, yeah, I think it has to do with nurturing and family and the need to be sensitive to emotional states, probably in kin or something. Yeah, I would think um, nurturing is something that would be the main thing, like being able to read a baby's face if they're happy, they're sad. Yeah, just or, really tuned into yeah. relationships, you know, human relationships. Yeah. But I mean. But obviously, the male, um, the need for men to bond and understand each other and the enemy say in war, which is not just a human trait, you know, that's also really intense. So men have a whole other set 
I think, of um, mechanisms to, you know, work out status, for instance, in a way that females cannot. We cannot, we have a lot of trouble working out conflict. Men get in a fight, it's resolved, status tends to be resolved, and then there's harm, it tends to be harmony until it's not anymore, until somebody challenges it. But that facilitates a bonding very quickly and intensely. And so I think there's something there that you have to read threat. Like you have to be able to be, and men are better at responding to threat and being attuned to signals wow, of that, threat. That is so weird because if I'm in a, if I go to a bar, or I'm at a restaurant, I can tell like, uh, we better leave. This doesn't feel mm-hmm. safe. Whereas my wife will go into a room and then we'll hang out with people and we'll leave and be like, oh, did you see how she was? Or did you see what that what he was doing? He was giving so much attitude. I'm like, he was? I didn't notice any of that. And it's yeah. what's interesting about these conversations, I do want to say this, I want to preface this, that at the end of the day, we're all individuals, right? So Yes, it's all a, on average. All, every, all these differences yes, are on average. However, and I, I hate the fact that we run away from this topic so much because we're so afraid to you know fall into those or, or, or encourage gender stereotypes norms or stereotypes. Or, yeah. But for me, it actually helps with understanding because anybody who's married for a long time, knows that oftentimes you just don't understand each other and mm-hmm. understanding this kind of stuff helps really helps me a lot because we kind of get each other a little bit better because you know she'll say well okay he's he's a he's a man he's not going to quite get this the way I do mm-hmm. or vice versa I may say well she might not feel the same way as I do because she's a a female it just brings in another perspective it another. does it just adds more richness to our understanding okay, I would yeah say. so I want to for I want to say two things so one is just to finish up the hunting and gathering thing. And that is that, yes, women have better, so men have better mental rotation, better navigation skills, and uh, women have better object location memory. But the size of the sex difference in object location memory is not as large as the, like the male advantage mm. um, in, say, mental rotation. But, yeah, so it's funny because in my house, everybody, you know, the, the men seem to be losing things, and for whatever reason, all just know exactly what where mm-hmm. it is probably because i'm a, the one who's doing more of the cleaning and putting things away etc <laughs> um but the second thing is and this is something that i um have talked about before but it is very important to me and it is what you just said which is that the insights that you can glean from understanding the forces that shape us whether they're you know environmental biological uh, uh, Obviously, it's both, right? Mm-hmm. So that um, we express our genes in the context of a given environment. And so that shapes how um, we express ourselves. But understanding those forces, um, for me, I it was is just personally really important, partly because I, and this is weird because I've been teaching about hormones for a long time, but until I wrote the book, I hadn't sort of made the connection between my nudging and pushing my British relatively unexpressive relatively to me, which isn't hard to be unemotional relative to me, um, pushing him to express himself more and to figure out why, what his problem is. Like, why isn't he able to access his emotions and like, tell me about how he's feeling. And um, I let up on that after writing the book, during writing the book, because um, one of the things is because I studied transgender the litter on transgender people who change their testosterone levels mm-hmm. i interviewed some of them for the book and i also got into this literature and one of the things is that when you take testosterone if you go from female to male levels like from my level to your level you do on average tend to become less emotional crying basically evaporates for mo- for many people oh i have first hand experience because so i, was- I so i so the but the, yeah. sorry the point is that i i then learned to accept him more Mm -hmm. and stop bugging him that's just who he is we're different and it helped our marriage like and it's really really improved that i just had an explanation that helped me to just accept that we're different and he doesn't need to be more like me um sorry i didn't mean no i um, was just i was just adding to what you were saying that um i have firsthand experience of that being a a bodybuilder who took uh copious amounts of testosterone yeah to become this pro bodybuilder and then to go off of it and then just have it crash you went off it entirely yes and you weren't producing your own because you'd shut your balls down basically and so i went through this huge emotional roller coaster that was one of the craziest things i ever felt i mean i i even battled a little depression over it i was crying over commercials like it was a wild ride can you say more about 
about what that was like? Like, did that give you an insight into what it's like to, to be a woman? No, I mean, uh, yeah, or, no, I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, as uh, as silly as that may sound, um, up until that point in my life, uh, never has a movie, or definitely not a like dog food commercial, <laughs> <laughs> made me get emotional. You know, and I felt myself holding back tears, and and and, or I, and I'd be by myself sometimes, going like, "This is this is weird. This feels really different." Like to, to feel that. Would it, but did it feel good or scary or overwhelming? So I'll tell you some of like the things that I. I'll or? tell you the things I liked. Yeah. Um, I was much more um, empathetic with my wife. I think her and I. Um, I was just. I felt calmer. I felt. Uh, I, I mean, there's definitely a, there's definitely a huge difference that you feel when you go through something like that, where your your hormone levels drastically change. I imagine people that go through things like menopause and stuff have similar type of feelings of a roller coaster on that. So I it felt inconsistent for me. I felt way more mellow. I, lo I lost a lot of aggression. So the the drive to lift heavy weights and to push like that. What about sex? Um, yeah, sex was uh, plummeted because yeah, no, it absolutely, that was, and that was actually the main driver to get me back into using a therapy dose was yeah. because then it started to, uh, affect our relationship because then she thought I wasn't attracted to her because I wasn't chasing her. Like I used to chase her all yeah. the time. It was, uh, I then was the one that was kind of more reserved with that. She'd have to come after me and then she felt insecure. Like I wasn't, I didn't find her beautiful anymore. So that was, this amazing. is all hormones. Yeah. What's amazing is every Everything you're talking about, which is so important to our lives, is all about hormones. Yep. It's just differences in hormones that have such profound effects. And we don't notice it in men because you guys are just, you know, have high T all the time. It doesn't fluctuate, right? It's not yeah. like in seasonal breeders, you know, which I talk about in the book, um, where you can see the changes, like, you know, with the red deer growing antlers and getting aggressive and having sperm and then, and high testosterone to um, outside of breeding season, you know, living peacefully with other males, not having weapons on their heads, et cetera. So, yeah, you, cause you can see it, but, and you guys, you can't see it, but you got the chance to oh, yeah, experience yeah. it. Yeah. It was, an, it was an, an you know, awful experience to be honest. I mean, it was enlightening. It was yeah. enlightening because it, it, it made me in more in touch with maybe more of her emotional side and, and empathy that she carried and calmer and less aggression. And so, uh, so I, that side of it, I think uh, I appreciated, um, but it, it did it. I lost a lot of drive, sex drive, drive. Dr and just drive in general. In general. So that's fascinating. Yeah, that, and that's what caused, the. I think, the depression was I lost the drive in general, the drive to uh, be more successful. And I didn't go from like a guy who cared about being successful and lifting weights to absolutely nothing, yeah. but I could feel a significant difference. It became yeah. less of a priority or a thing I thought about. You, you know, Carol, speaking of drive, I, I remember reading this article a, a while ago that really um, made made a lot of sense to me in in the sense of why because if you even now today if you look at the craziest risk taking behavior anything sports jobs whatever they tend to be dominated by men if there's somebody that's going to jump a bike over flaming cars and do a backflip it's usually a guy that's going to end up doing this and risking his a life, right? A young guy, yeah. So it's just crazy and then ambitious. I mean, there are definitely women who do that stuff too, You're right, right but it's on average. You're yeah. right. We're individuals. You're absolutely right. But there's generally speaking, yes. you know, and risk-taking behavior in general, like men's car insurance is more expensive because that's we right. tend to speed more often. And get in more accidents are more likely to die in car accidents. Right. And so I, I read this article and it made perfect sense to me. In this article, I don't remember what the number was, but it said something like a society could lose something like 60 or 70% of its men and still survive. Whereas if a society lost, I think it was like 30% of its females or 20%, it would have trouble uh, thriving because of course, one man can impregnate X amount of women. You better be a good one if you're not going to have very, <laughs> Right. Very and where women can only have one baby essentially in right. nine months. And I'm like, maybe that's where the the risk taking comes from is that we're more expendable like it like we we're, we're, we should take the risk because we if we die we do well in a sausage fest yeah, yeah if we go and die then it's not as big of a deal but if a bunch of women die holy cow that could be a big issue well I, yeah um no i think that's correct basically that women need to survive have a long life and be healthy to maximize their reproductive success. So that's what we're all designed to do. Estrogen helps her do that. Mm. Gives her more body fat. 
she doesn't have the testosterone converting, you know, energy into muscle. Her She's taking an energy and converting much more of it into fat. So we're designed to convert energy into offspring, right? Mm. So for men, yeah, risk-taking can pay off it with higher reproductive success in a way that it does not for females. Mm -hmm. Females are competitive and can be aggressive, but it tends to be not in a way that puts their physical health at risk. Oh, very so we can be extremely, as you probably know, nasty to mm -hmm. each other in a way that men tend not to be. You know, it's it's an indirect kind of mean girl type of aggression, but it's low physical risk. Mm. And men have a different type of aggression that and that risk taking, yeah, is going to play out on the highway in a, in a modern environment in all these different ways. I think, you know, obviously that's why like mixed martial arts and violent video games and football and all that are like so popular. So if you just look at the money involved in uh, like, you know, female sports compared, compared to male sports, I mean, it's too bad for women athletes, but there's mm -hmm. just a huge difference there. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. you, you had brought up uh, studies on transgender individuals, which I yeah. think is fascinating because especially today, because more than ever, we're able to study behavioral changes in biological men and women who then change the hormones radically. Like yeah. what does that do to their brain? What does that do to their behaviors? You mentioned something about blunting emotions. We had a while ago, we had uh, a transgender athlete and a transgender lawyer on the show. And this trans was, woman athlete? A trans female and then trans male. And the reason why we had them on the show was because we had said that uh, being born biologically as a male and then going through puberty and then going on hormones, you still retained a large percentage of your advantage. And so they came on to discuss this and debate it with us. But one of the things that really fascinated me was the transgender male. So this person was went from female to male. They said that when they went on testosterone, that they noticed that it was like you took the emotion, like if you had a light switch where your emotions are on, dimmer switch, yes. whoa, turned it way down. And and he goes, yeah, I all of a sudden felt like my emotions went from this wide rainbow of colors to like three <laughs> emotions. Is this common when you when you studied yeah. this? No, I literally, my hair is standing on end as you're talking about it to, okay. to hear you say that um, because even though again, I've been researching hormones and teaching about them for so long. The work that I did for this book on, you know, interviewing transgender people who told their stories about what it is like, including um, a non-binary um, male who, someone who's born male, who is now non-binary, who's on puberty blockers, and a female who transitioned to male and then back to female so she could report on it wow. as a wow. woman so that that is intense but it was that work that was most sort of striking and powerful to me probably because I, I hadn't been as um familiar with the details of that literature but what you said is yes that is what the scientific letter uh, scientific literature shows that testosterone does have this dampening effect again on average but it's what you know it's what you experience and the reason it gives puts my hair on end is because emotions are such an incredibly important of our important component of our lives how we feel our drives our sex drive our um ability to experience joy and pain and vulnerability so it's it tends to be the more vulnerable emotions that are squashed and wow. but also there's something about joy i also heard um coming up anger is not squashed it doesn't necessarily amplify but it is one that um people still have access to if they um when they uh transition say female to male mm -hmm. their a lot of their emotions are dampened but not anger that's one that mm. people still feel that they're in touch the, with. um the trans uh, male also brought up too that the uh he noticed his view of women started to change a bit too in terms of like objectifying them and that was pretty interesting like their sexual like uh, yeah. drive and yeah it, i remember it ramped up and, and okay so remember this is somebody who i don't know what age this person transitioned they, they had gone through puberty as a female oh they were the, 30s yeah was, okay 30s. so this is someone who like every woman knows what it's like to be sexually objectified we don't like it sure. i mean all you know some people do some people like a little objective sexual objectification here and there that's the truth but 
overall, yeah, it's not pleasant. We want to be, t- you know, considered for our entire humanity. So that's annoying when we know that men are viewing us as sexual objects. However, here's another area where the literature really blew my mind and changed how I view this entire thing. Um, this entire issue, it made gave me uh, empathy towards that feeling that and the struggle that men have because I saw, wait a minute, this is has to do with this hormone. It really does. It's not just the patriarchy. It's a struggle that men feel and sometimes feel very bad about it and needs, I think it needs to be acknowledged that men view the target of their sexual attraction on average in a different way than females view the target of their sexual attraction. It's not that we don't find, you know, whoever we're attracted to totally hot and we have, you know, high libidos, et cetera. But it seems to be a very different sense of urgency and a different feeling and it's more physically based. And I feel like that needs to be discussed and understood so that for men who we want to help men navigate that territory Mm. i hear men say like i don't know how to talk to her i don't know what to say i don't know how to talk to women and i've always been like what are you talking about just talk to them but if you think like from a woman's point of view if you then think wow this guy of course doesn't know how to talk to her because that involves her brain and her (laughs) personality and her whole Mm. humanity and he's just really like physically attracted to her how do you put those things together and be normal yeah you know and and, you know it's funny you're saying this and any guy who goes through puberty knows what a radical (laughs) Oh, confusing man. shift that, oh, that was the, that was the most uh, um, emotional time of my life was you know 15 to 18 ish and i remember being in high school and I, I remember crying over this I remember being so emotional that when i would leave my girlfriend's house i was crying because i we both grew up in homes that were religious and you know sexual behavior was was not not accepted and so but i had this urge so bad and you know she would be telling me no and i would be like oh my god and then i'd be trying to do what she said focus on the movie on this i just it was the weirdest dynamic of feeling this uncontrollable urge but then also knowing that it's supposed to be bad and i'm not supposed to do it and she doesn't want it and then trying to wrestle that as a young teenage boy and not knowing did you have any i mean this is probably a stupid question but sort of resources or anyone you could talk no, to not and- i so my father committed suicide when i was 7 and so i didn't have a oh dad oh my god a i'm dad. so sorry no it's okay i did my mom remarried into uh, an, an abusive relationship after that so my stepfather and i did not have a relationship like that to where i could go to him for advice my mom was very young when she had me so even her understanding so they and they weren't big readers so i was on my own to kind of figure this stuff out and um, I just remember that being one of the most difficult times in my life. And then it's just, it's not socially accepted, right? It's not something that would be okay for me to be that way, or at least I wasn't told that it's okay. Yeah, by the know? way, I want to make a comment on this because we we do have these uh, evolutionary and biological drivers, but we're also conscious, social, intelligent beings. So this doesn't excuse bad behavior. I want to be clear on that. Just because we have this hormone that drives men to potentially look at things and sexually objectify women and have this drive, mm. you're still responsible for your actions. No, no, no sorry, but sorry, that's yeah. the thing. It's the behavior that the thing I'm getting at is the feeling that you are that's struggling right. yeah. with. And I know the where behavior, you're going. Yeah, we can judge and condemn whatever right. the behavior, yeah. the consequences, but not- No, I know exactly that, where you're going. Okay. You're, there was sorry, nobody to there to, to talk me and say, it's right. okay, this is normal, son, or this yes, is- Yes, and it's mm-hmm. fine. It's, yeah. it's, it's You have to learn how to behave. I felt like a bad person. Yes. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like I I felt like I, something whole... was wrong with me because yes. this was so hard for me. It's and so I, powerful. Yeah, it was such a powerful thing that no matter how many times I was told that no or told that we shouldn't, I was still struggling yeah. with that. Now, and so it put me on this emotional roller coaster as a young teenager. Now, Carol, boy. did you look at um, did you look at same sex couples? Because the reason why I, I'm asking that is because I, this is me guessing, me speculating, okay, is that when you have two men in a relationship or two women in a relationship, do you see the male aspects amplify with two men think? and female? I would guess so, right? I would guess you probably see more risk-taking behavior in, in, in male-male relationships, more well, the sex, sexual promiscuity, yeah. Yeah. whereas with the women, probably less. Now, did you did you look at this? Yes. And, okay. Okay. Yes. What are the, some of the things that, that you would see? Well- it's just so great to have um, to be to have these examples of male sexual 
uh, behavior and male sexual culture and female sexual behavior and culture unrestrained by the limitations or needs of the opposite sex. Yes. So what do you see when you take the, you know, when a man can have sex the way he wants because he's having it with other men, right? Yeah. I just think that's great. Um, I'm just thrilled that we're going in the right direction socially on that front. Um to just allow that to be expressed, you know, in healthy ways, of course. But from a scientific, from a science, from, sci from a scientific point of view, of course, we're seeing male nature expressed in a more pure way. And what's interesting is people expect gay men to have lower testosterone because they're feminized in some ways. But this, the sexual nature is a hundred percent masculine. Mm -hmm. It's no different. It's what men want, yeah. gay or straight. They want to have a lot of sex and they prefer to have a higher number of sexual partners. And if you're, you know, in gay culture, you can. And of course, I am not saying that this is what all gay men want or all gay men do. There's lots of monogamy in, in gay sexual culture too. But there's, it's more often there are agreements that having, you know, affairs uh, or or extra pair sex is more acceptable because oh they get it. You can still be in love with each other and have your primary partner, but have a little sex on oh the side. Oh my God, Carol, I, you know, I have a, 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 an uncle who's uh, who's gay. He passed away, but great guy. Loved the guy. And I, I was younger, obviously. He was, we're, we were close in age. I remember we were hanging out and we were watching at the time MTV. This is when MTV used to have those spring break, you know, shows or whatever with yeah, the bands and the, and the girls and all that and we're watching it <laughs> yeah. and obviously he's my uncle we're close and so we tease each other and this girl comes up in a bikini and I'm looking at him I'm like man look at that like look at what you're missing like you know we're joking and he says he looks at me and he goes you have no idea and I said well, well, you what? didn't know obviously he was gay I did know yeah oh. I knew he was gay oh you said yeah, look at just, what you're missing yeah, I get yeah, it yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so sorry. we're teasing each other yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We're, very, we're very close and okay. and you know it was, it was a great relationship and he goes you have no idea Sal you have no idea what it's I'm like what do you mean he goes Imagine you go into a bar and you see a hot girl across the bar and you walk up to her and you, without saying a word, you grab her butt. What do you think is going to happen? I'm like, she's going to yell at the bouncer to kick me out or I'm going to get arrested. He goes, that doesn't happen in gay bars. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I forgot you guys are all guys. I guess it's all exactly right, so, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So that's an interesting, that's interesting because it suggests to me it's not about necessarily about testosterone. There might be a role somehow prenatally, but even there we don't see any evidence mm -hmm. for a difference. There's the the sexual nature is a hundred percent masculine and it's just great that you can sort of see it unleashed. And then of course in lesbian sexual culture you basically have the opposite. Mm -hmm. Um there's just much, much less um sex. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you, Carol, sorry. have you have you read Sex at Dawn? Yeah, ages ago. Yeah. Christopher, what's his last name? I can't think. It's. I'm just curious. Yes. I'm curious to but what no, your thoughts. Yeah. So his his whole philosophy is that we were, we have evolved to uh, not be monogamous. That we were had many sexual oh, partners, right. and that's kind of. And there's a huge, especially in the health and fitness space. There's kind of this movement that's been going uh, on on in this yes yeah, yeah. in now, this direction. Now, here, my argument against that is always, and I would love your input on this, Carol. My argument has always been that monogamy has been practiced uh, widespread in very large popular societies, and I believe and polygamy, it, polygamy Official as well. Official polygamy, yeah. More so com, polygamy more much common. older, right? But m later on, monogamy, and to me, it's like okay, this oh, also. Right. Yeah, there it is by uh, Chris Ryan. Yeah, Christopher Ryan. This points to the fact that yes, we are driven by our biology, but also we're smart enough to say this is beneficial for culturally. society and culturally. Yes. yes, that is. I think that's exactly right. So um, there are a lot of problems that come with polygamy, and it's you know that the highest high status males who can acquire the most resources are able to and can and legally can acquire the most females. But that leaves a lot of young men without the ability to acquire a mate. What do you do when you have a young, high testosterone guy who can't get a mate? You get violence, He's You get violence. Yeah. You get a lot of bad behavior. So and just troublesome, you know, aggressive, competitive um, mm. behavior and high levels of violence in a society that has that social system. So yes, this is culturally, socially a positive um, move, I guess, towards uh, monogamy and having that be the legal uh, form of long-term partnering. But in terms of the evolutionary evidence to what we're kind of designed for, there's really no evidence that uh, the 
sort of evolutionary, uh, most relevant evolutionary uh, mating system would have been monogamy. So, but serial monogamy is what yeah. we're thought to have um, practiced because that's what's most beneficial for the survival of the offspring is for the pair to be together until the kid is something like four years old till it's weaned basically and because the um we're we are sort of designed to breastfeed for much longer than a year you know anywhere from like one to well three, yeah because a, a human baby is born as a fetus essentially can't do anything for right. itself the, the mom really is in a, not really in a situation to go hunt and provide so it makes sense that the male would stick around right for us to survive and then, but there's also facultative paternal investment which means that you know in some for some men in some environments it's going to make sense to stay with one female maybe for her whole reproductive career maybe for a part of it um, but in other environments you know or for other males a better strategy mm. may be to just compete out on the open market mm. you know or he may not have any other choice or you know so there's a huge amount of variety and I think that probably represents differences in social systems that we had in our evolutionary past in different environments now you've been studying hormones for a while I've been talking about this for a long time and I can't imagine a more challenging climate than now for someone like you who studies what you do and talks about what you do what are some of the challenges that you're that you've been encountering because you're literally talking about the differences between men and women from a hormonal and biological standpoint, which seems to be taboo these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this, I mean, are you like worried about what you're talking about or have you been attacked? And especially since now you've got more of a public persona. Yeah. Um, so I came, f I really had a very small life before this. I mean, I was just teaching at Harvard. I had my little family. I, I didn't do anything really publicly. Um, but the reason that I wrote the book is because it's a challenging time. Oh, I so love you. So it is because I felt like I'm in a position to speak up. I have a, we're financially secure, basically. Mm -hmm. So I do, this is so important to me because it's science, which is I love has changed my life from somebody who is confused and lacked direction to someone who is learning to understand the world with this incredibly powerful tool. And I feel like people are trying to take that away. Um, and that the favored viewpoint that gets repeated in the media, in the New York Times, in the, you know, Guardian, there's these favored interpretations of reality, which are not true <laughs> and it's uh what seems you know i hate to say it but what seems politically correct and sort of these feel-good stories that we're basically all the same and sex isn't real and that should give us hope and that should increase the rights of people with like all kinds of gender differences and we can accept each other better if we believe that biology that biology isn't that important and that's just completely confused we can do all that stuff and pay attention to biology and understand the facts, mm -hmm. right? And as a science educator, as someone who came really from the bottom up, from literally like studying chimps and just being fascinated by how all this works, like I didn't come in with an agenda. And I don't, the only agenda that I have is that science is the one place where I feel like people can come together and can agree on the facts and that is being taken away. Where are we going to come together? There's so much divisiveness and um, I'm really, really bothered by that. So I wanted to step into it. But amazingly, I'm getting so much positive feedback. Oh, good. That's good. Because That's I think when you tell people the truth, you're respecting them. I was respected as a you know young scientist uh, when... I became emotional. Uh, there was a, a seminar I attended as a grad student when I became really emotional about a hypothesis about the uh, whether rape was an adaptation in humans. Mm. And I said, this guy's an asshole, the guy who wrote the paper. And um, I rejected the hypothesis because it made me upset. It felt wrong. But that's not 
how you're supposed to work to understand the world as a scientist. You're supposed to look at the facts. You're supposed to dispassionately evaluate It's supposed hypotheses. to be amoral. Like, you got to remove that. So yes, the facts. yes. You want to understand how the world works. And if it is an adaptation, I certainly want to know even if it is hard. So the professor in that seminar, instead of saying, oh, are you okay? And like coddling me, said, look at the data. What do you think of the hypothesis? Evaluate the hypothesis. And I realized in that moment that, yes, yeah, some truths can be painful, but I'd much rather know them and learn how to think critically about the facts and the world. And that is what I want to try to give to anyone who's interested through my book is the truth, but still being compassionate and fighting for human rights and the rights of people with all kinds of differences, which I am very passionate about. And I really think you can do both. So I'm trying to do that and I'll take whatever's coming. But um, I've had a little bit of blowback about like appearing on Joe Rogan or the people who subtweet me had said something transphobic at some point. But um, I would, first of all, I, th I think Joe's great. I think you guys are great. And what, if you said, if you made some comment like two years ago that I don't agree with, I don't really care. Mm, yeah. Like that's not what it's about. You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to understand the world. And um, so I don't like this idea that if you are associated with someone and, and other people don't agree with all of their ideas, like you're a bad mm. guy for associating with them. That's ridiculous. We need to come together and talk. And so that's why this, you doing this is is great. Thank what, you. What, what, what comes to mind, Carol, or what, do you have concerns when you hear things like toxic masculinity? Yeah, I don't, I understand, I, I understand why people want to use that term because it seems like, you know, and there is some truth to this, obviously, the sort of most dangerous aspects uh, and maybe to some degree most disturbing aspects of human behavior are committed by men. Um, Predominantly. Like murder, rape, etc. But you guys aren't murderers, as far as I know, and no. rapists. And <laughs> no, I serve my time. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But, but we you all know, have a past. Um, most men are not those things. There's, and that's the extreme end of, of bad male behavior, right? That's out on the extreme. Some cultures, there are some differences, but also we were talking before you started taping about, um, I think before you started taping, but even while we were taping about you guys, your devotion to your kids. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that part of why I love my husband is because of his masculinity and his feeling protected. And I'm not saying this is true for every woman, but his stoicism, that is stuff, yeah, it bothers me here and there. But ultimately, I, I think that we're a pair. We fit together. We complement each other. There's so much beauty in masculinity. Um, and I have a 12-year-old boy, and the term toxic masculinity pisses me off because it's... it's um, I think it has become associated with just plain masculinity and um, people are feeling there's no one should feel bad about their natures. It's behavior. And if we could I don't want masculinity to be toxic. I want the behaviors associated with that to be toxic, but women do a lot of um, nasty stuff that really hurts people too. <laughs> Shouldn't it just be called assholes? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, or, uh, but, but there's like a particular, yeah, I mean, no, I agree. That's the, what you want to deal with is assholes. But there are there's like a particular brand of asshole who's like, okay, this morning, I'll just say, because I, I went for a run. I've never been here before. I went for a run, which I thought was going to be, sorry, I don't want to insult anything, but no, there's um, some park um, near her where I thought I could go for like oh, a this, long yeah, run. Yeah, here you're like, you're, you're, you you got to be careful where you go. But so <laughs> I went and yeah. I started feeling really nervous mm -hmm. and I started feeling like, is this a safe place to run? I'm by myself. I don't see any other women. In fact, I don't see any other runners and I, nobody can see me. Nobody can hear me if I scream. And people, don't, a lot of like men might not understand that um, that's just, so the whole way I was nervous. I was like, am I going to get raped basically? Yeah. So that, maybe it's toxic masculinity or men like harass. I well, have a gay friend who was saying that he goes to the gym and he's small and that he gets harassed by these big tough guys at the gym. And he's like, no, because we had this conversation about toxic, toxic masculinity. And he's saying, no, that's what that means. So I get it, but I don't like it because it it's not, 
fair to masculinity. Yeah, and there's a difference. Between... I don't think it's helpful. Who is that? How is that helpful? Right. No, I'll give you an example. Like, okay, aggression could be labeled a masculine trait, but physical. aggression is not the same as uh, violence. So, right. So phys- physical aggression. Yeah. So, but, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, or 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 drive or right. you know risk taking. But risk taking can be uh, taking a chance with my business. Or it could be right. me doing crazy drugs on the street with a dirty needle or something like that, right? right. Which men were more likely yes. to do. I, you know, this this is such a fascinating subject for me, and I love looking at the differences between, generally between men and women, and especially the dysfunction. This is why I think you see a lot of interesting things. For example, you're going to see, generally speaking, more men who are violent towards other people physically. That's a very, in my, you know, I guess to my estimation, a maladaptive form of, you know, maybe right. masculinity. But then with women, you know, there are cases where you see, for example, what's that disorder where the mom will like poison their kids slowly? Munchausen. Munchausen. That doesn't. That often doesn't happen with men. That's much more. Oh, that's a, right. That's a common, right. and and it's almost like a a, a maladaptive dysfunctional. Femin, you know, uh, yes. part of fem, you know, being a f- a feminine because you want to take care of, you know, you want to be nurturing. So you're making your kids sick so that they constantly are. We're bullying are people on social media so they end up killing themselves. Yeah, that mm. is uh, that's mm. more yeah. of a thing that women are doing. Yeah. Um, men aren't doing that as yeah. much. But I do think it's important to say that in terms of differences, men and women compared to other mammals, there's really small that's general right. differences. That's right. Where you see the big differences are on the extremes that's right. right so if you look at like in the middle we're pretty similar but if you go to like the most violent people in the world the like the number one like a one percent violent people it's probably 90 something percent well and that's the problem that i have men. with that the toxic masculinity is you then you you get a, like your son who's only 12 years old who hears that term thrown and around he's a sweet he's and, a yeah and, and he, then he starts questioning so if, if some of his behaviors is yeah. falling in that category which he probably has no business even having to worry or think about it because he's not that mm. end no of the and spectrum. what you i love what you said about how you felt going through your adolescence you know, women are always celebrated for becoming a woman, right? Going through that period. We, we, we celebrate that. We need to celebrate that in men too. It's mm. the same. It, that should be a beautiful thing for you to go through that and to become like a sexually viable adult yeah. that has other responsibilities associated with that. You know, right. that should be positive. Well, you know, cultural, mm-hmm. uh, lots of cultures have coming of age yes. things for boys yeah. because with girls... I mean, I have an 11 year old daughter. She's probably going to get her period soon. So you get this very physical sign of, oh, I'm now a woman, right? Right. What do we? What do guys get? Like we get hairy. I mean, you know, it's, there's really nothing. Uncomfortable boners. Yeah. Seminal, yeah. seminal mission. Yeah, exactly. There's there's not this big like you know like oh nocturnal. Here it is. Sorry, not seminal. Nocturnal. Nocturnal. nocturnal mission. Mission. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but lots of cultures have those, and I think that's probably what you're talking about. So yeah. the, the guys, yeah. the boys know. Oh, this yeah. is the next. You know, and thing. also with toxic masculinity, what is the term for? you guys taking physical risks to help people you don't even know and putting your own lives yeah, at yeah, risk. Yeah. You do way, way more of that than women. Women certainly do it. It happens. But that's overwhelmingly yeah. like uh, a male territory. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, an amazing part of masculinity yeah. is is that kind of physical heroism. Yeah, although you take a you put a mom's child at risk. That's, I, that's I have right. Seen no, women, that's when you see that's when you see moms putting their lives. Oh, I at saw risk. I saw my 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 mom who is de- she's deathly afraid of dogs. She's not a dog person, and she had at the time my son was a baby, putting him in the back of the car, and the neighbor's German Shepherd jumped in the back. Friendly dog, jumped in the back of the car. And my mom physically threw this dog out of the car and screamed yeah. like a lion. And I was like, yeah. I heard it in the house. And I was like, that, you did that? <laughs> I can totally relate. Yeah. I can relate. Yeah, you know, and that was because she was being protected. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, so women definitely will put themselves at risk for their offspring, but men are much more likely to do it for total, you know, just strangers, mm-hmm. which is amazing. So now these these differences, these general differences that we have, let's let's focus on just because you're, you're, the book's on testosterone and because I feel like masculinity is much more attacked these days than, uh, than femininity. What are the benefits uh, or why do we need a lot of these masculine traits? First, let's list them off and then why, what, what are the benefits today? We don't hunt anymore. We're not at war all the time. Society's far more safer than it's ever been. Like, what are the? Why do we need them in the first place? Why can't we just homogenize and all become the same? 
<laughs> You're throwing a lot at me. Yeah. First of all, boring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Boring. And I would just say that the practical impediment there is that we are designed to be through natural and sexual selection to be attracted to our complement mm. in a way. And that's even, you know, to some degree within homosexual relationships that where there's kind of a... Yeah, there's normally a very opposite, even if it's yes, the same sex, the yes. one partner takes on certain traits. And yes. Then, yeah. mm. And I think that it's a sep there's a separate question about what society would be like, you know, if, say, we, you know, castrated men, mm -hmm. right? Um, so first of all, I think it just wouldn't work because we have these needs, right? Mm. But second of all, the things that you guys have all been talking about, although I can't say like this study found that that we need um, tes that testosterone causes this thing that that seems to be like this drive towards a goal that seems to be different, right? Between the sexes, this need to create, to take risks. Um, one year in my class, I asked my students just to have a conversation about what would the world be like if we castrated men. And somebody said, I don't think we'd have tall buildings. Mm. <laughs> and, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And who knows, you know, it's possible that, that, that kind of, um, those, that, those kinds of like technological advancements. I don't want to say that women don't play a role because of course they do. I think the risk taking involved with that is probably where you're... Yeah, but something to do with that, you know, we get to have babies. I made a baby in my body. I created a human, you know, with my husband's DNA, whatever, but I'm the one who grew it inside of me. Oh, I'll tell you what. I a, used my boobs yeah. and the milk that I made... <laughs> To grow him after he came out oh, of me. Watching that. What as else a, do I have to do after that? Yeah. I, I made my kid. Like, I tell you what. Done. Watching that as a man, I'll tell you what. Like I'm a very involved father. <laughs> I have three children, and watching my wife. I just had a. We have a eight, almost nine month old now. Oh. And watching her connect. And I remember this distinctly with my my oldest son. Right. That because this was the first time I had a kid. I remember, you know, at the time this was my ex wife. She was pregnant. And, you know, I, I knew that there was a baby. I knew that we were going to have a kid, but I was jealous because of the connection that she had yeah. that I didn't feel till he was born. Like until he was born, it wasn't, I wasn't connected like she was. And I think that that's something that isn't valued or, or celebrated enough. Like that is a remarkable thing that men just, who knows in the future if we'll be able to experience this with, you know. I, I feel like motherhood in general isn't celebrated enough. Oh yeah, I, I, like I agree. There's been a, a decline on that for the last 100%. couple of decades too. 100%. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that because like I just, you know, I, I, I teach, I just wrote a book. I'm super busy, you know, that's rewarding. I'm trying to make an impact, you know, in the world now and not have my tiny little life. But at the same time, I do, and that's all been great and I've challenged myself and grown from it. But the most important thing to me is I want, you know, to have more time. I feel like, oh my God, I am mm. don't have enough time with my kid and my husband. And it's, you know, I feel pulled in so many directions, but if I had to choose, I'd totally choose being a mom and just have yeah. my family. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a struggle I think a lot of people go through. But you, I, I, I think generally speaking, you see that a lot with with moms, whereas with dads, maybe not as much. You know, we're, well, because you know that you have someone. I mean, a lot of really successful men, of course, just know that their kid is being loved, hopefully, you know, oh, yeah. and and cared for, and they have the support to go and pursue what they want. So mm -hmm. there's that too. But I think that is a real constraint on women but i mean it doesn't have to be a constraint mm. it's it's a joy for so many women yeah and i think that needs to be celebrated and respected and it would be great if we could get paid for, <laughs> paid yeah. you know for that and have more economic independence because that's a big part of it a lot of women you know it's very very tough to have to be economically dependent on somebody else right yeah um, mm -hmm. that's that's a, that's an excellent point. carol was there anything that when you uh that since we've been talking that we haven't covered that you feel is something that's uh, grossly misunderstood about testosterone. I know we've talked about a lot of different things right now, but in your research and writing the book, you know, is there something that we haven't touched on or talked about today that you feel like that that is still misunderstood about testosterone? Well, 
there is one point that a lot of um, critics of the importance of testosterone in athletic ability um, try to use as a sort of counterpoint. And they will say that individual differences, you know, if you look at testosterone really doesn't help sporting performance, because if you look at testosterone levels among men, it's not always the case that the one with the highest testosterone level beats the one with the lower testosterone Boy, what an level. oversimplification of okay. athletic performance. So I just want to say that in some case, for some sports, that is the case, but that's not the issue. The issue is why do men just totally blow away women in sports, which they do. It's a fact and it's okay, right? That's how, I mean, it, yeah, it might suck for women, but that's how it works. It will suck for women, of course, if men and women are playing, have to compete with each other, women will lose, right? So the point I think that's misunderstood is that that is a tactic that testosterone critics use is to say testosterone is not that important because within sex, it doesn't all, you can't yeah. predict like libido or aggression or athletic performance in a lot of cases. And that's true, but it's not about within sex. It's about, we're trying to explain sex differences in a lot of different things. And it's the whopping, you know, 10 to 20 or higher times the level of testosterone that you guys have in all these different phases of life, you mm. know, in utero, in puberty, in adulthood that we don't have, that give physical advantages that everybody knows about, you know, like way more muscle and way less fat and, you know, <laughs> body size and bone yeah. strength and hemoglobin. And like, it's not about the little differences within sex. So that is just something to keep in mind that those levels, those differences within men and to some degree within women, although women, it's more impactful. Those just aren't anywhere near as important as the differences between yeah. sex. Yeah, and I think that's also when they make that comparison, I think it's silly because if you take the same individual and give them more testosterone, you will see an increase in performance. But there's also androgen. In muscle. <clears throat> yeah, and there's also androgen receptor density. Yes, there's yes. A, just your, how good, how proprioceptive you are and your athletic ability. I mean, right. I could have higher testosterone than a pro basketball player, but he's going to crush me on the court because he's right. uh, so skilled. Are there any negatives to testosterone? Like we, we're talking about what they, what it does and potential positives and influences on behavior. Are there things that testosterone can cause that, that tend to cause detriments? I know men tend to not live as long as women. Is that due to testosterone? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's talk about some of those. I mean, there's a, you know, it's a cost. So, um, it's an energetic cost. Growing muscle is very expensive. So there's the effects on, there's the energy spent on muscle. There's the energy spent on physical activity, on risk taking. So, you know, more men die young from accidents for mm. one thing. So that, that reduces life expectancy in males. There's immune system costs. Um, so there are different diseases that the sexes get, um, at different ages and test so testosterone can have some negative effects on survival um sort of on longevity but i would say the the biggest negative is the um is physical aggression and sexual assault and mm. those i think are ultimately products of testosterone the important piece is the power of culture in shaping the expression of the of the those natures right so we know that cultures that have much stricter laws and social norms that you know really strictly prohibit those kinds of negative behaviors we see that men are able to control their mm -hmm. behavior right so this isn't something that has to be played out we have to remember how important culture is so one big misunderstanding is that people are you know people are arguing all over the place about nature versus nurture is it testosterone or is it culture it's both and it's so clear mm -hmm. that it is both and that the family you grow up in, the the you know laws in the country you grow up in, your religion, all of those things are going to shape how we express our nature. Yeah. So like that's the most important point is appreciating the power of testosterone and biology in no way means that culture doesn't hasn't have an influence. Yeah. It doesn't change our natures. You know, we're going to have these different natures and what matters is how we express them. That's so, such a great point. Yeah. One, of, one of my favorite examples of that, you know, there was a documentary I watched a long time ago that was just so interesting. I think it was called Knuckle. And it talked, it, it was a, a, a documentary on, uh, they, they, call, they call themselves travelers, where they, they live in these RVs and they're in Ireland and they kind of like follow. Irish gypsies. Yeah, and they yeah. follow Wait, their what's own. what's it called again? Knuckle. 
It sounds interesting. It's really good, okay. right? And they and they 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 the way that they handle uh, conflicts within each other's families or with other families is they bare knuckle box. Now here's the thing, though. <laughs> now here's where the culture comes in, but right? It works. So that's that's the aggression part, right? Yeah. That's the the instinct. The men are going to fight, right? But they don't just all attack each other and kill each other. It's ritualized. They have rules. Yes. Okay, you pick someone from your family. We pick someone from our family. Here's the rules. Doesn't uh, the movie Snatch depict this? Isn't that where that? Yes, yeah. Snatch yeah. That does that from? too. Yeah. Like, look at mixed martial arts. Like, yeah. like it, that's obviously culture's influence on this natural tendency to to be violent. We're not just killing each other. We're like put on gloves. You can't poke each yes. other in the eye. You have to weigh the same amount and you know and all yeah. that stuff. So to so me, they're that's acknowledging such a great the nature and channeling it in a way that's works for that culture. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yes. So that's one of my favorite examples yeah. of that. Well, this has been a great conversation, yeah. Carol. Yeah, yeah you've been Thank one of my favorite so guests. Much. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. really, really fun. Sal, yeah. Justin, mm. and Adam. Yes. You got it. Thank and you. <laughs> Nailed <Yeah. it. laughs> Everybody else. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I highly recommend this book uh, if you want to know anything about uh, behavior between the sexes and just testosterone in general. It's very, very good. And there's lots of, it's really written in a way that the biology, the science should be accessible to anybody, who, p even people who don't have a scientific background. There's lots of stories. Mm -hmm. There's my own personal stories in there. So there's a lot of narrative. It's yeah. I just, just think like, it's a very important message right now mm -hmm. because we. I just feel like it's, it, 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 for some reason, it's taboo to talk about the difference between men and women right now. It's that we, we, we're it supposed to us back like, in reality. Yeah, everybody, no, there is no difference between the sexes. No, and, no, and you are always responsible for your behavior. And we are all individuals. I firmly believe that. But I, I think ignoring science is dangerous. And as soon as science becomes politicized, we're screwed because... It's one of the last objective fields exactly. that we have. Almost nothing is objective anymore. We work in the fitness space, and I can't tell you how much information is driven by Ugh. complete bullshit. Just terrible. No science whatsoever, and it's terrifying from a, yeah. a fitness perspective because I'm like, no, that's not true at all. What you're reading, that's obviously driven by somebody's. People have agenda. to know who to trust. They yes. have to have trusted sources of information, and we're losing those. Yes. Oh, I do have one question. This is interesting. I read this, and I backed. I actually read studies on this that back this up. I would love your opinion. So apparently, this is this is weird. The 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 difference between your ring finger and your index finger. So if your ring finger is a lot longer than your than your index finger as a man, that means you were exposed to more testosterone in utero versus if your ring finger oh, was. I thought you were going to do a shorter. size thing. No, <laughs> yeah. apparently the size between. No, is that true? So I have a section on that in the book, and I have a little diagram showing you how to do the measurement. So I am a like. That's rare for a female. I, I'm more masculine than something like 90% of men in wow. terms of my 2D40. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that's just because, so if you measure from the bottom wrinkle to the top of the bone on this one, on this, your index finger, and then same thing on your ring finger, and then um, calculate the ratio. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm like 0.89 or something. Um, and what this actually is, the so people are have published a lot of studies on this because it's easy to measure it and just anytime you're looking at um anytime you run any study where you have male and males and females and you want to be able to say oh i got an index of um the level of testosterone they're exposed to in utero and all i have to do it's easy is you know do this measurement right you just get a, a xerox and then you can measure it fascinating um although people probably don't even use xerox anymore <laughs> um so a lot of people are publishing these studies and saying it's associated with like athletic ability or libido or aggression. Those are the studies that get published. Mm. The eight zillion studies that measured it that didn't find it was associated with those things don't get published. Oh. That's called the file drawer effect. However, that being said, there is a sex difference. So that's clear. But to see it, you need a lot of people. So it's not a huge effect. You need a large sample Got size. It. But yeah, what I have is unusual for a woman. Most women will have, and this is an estrogen effect also and it's interesting because well whatever i'm not going to go off on, on another tangent um so women will tend to have the index finger the same size as the ring finger yes. or a little bit longer and that's sort of a feminine look like their fingers are Im important indexes of estrogen i think that's why the nail industry you know is so oh, wow um, popular because you want to have that long sort of slender um oh, look great, on your fingers that's fascinating but uh so I think it's the evidence there is not super robust, but there is a sex difference. It is related to testosterone exposure. We see it in non-human animals. Um, 
it's kind of fun. You can, you know, Google it, but I wouldn't um, put too much faith in anyone's individual measurement and what that predicts yeah, about we're, them we're, individually. When you're, when you're gone, we're all going to compare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. As soon as you walk <laughs> out the door, for sure. Yeah. What did you call, I want you to, I've never heard anyone say that before, what did you call the file drawer effect? What did you call yeah, that? Yeah, it's it? the file. So that is publication bias. And it's a, it is an issue in science and we're making some advances there and people are publishing pre-registering studies and what and the hypothesis that they are testing and the study would then you know get published whether or not that hypothesis was supported but what happens in um publishing is that exciting unusual results are published they may or may not be replicated but who cares because it's already been you know in the new york times and, yeah. and on mm -hmm. the cnn and everybody's super excited about this one little thing so what we want to see bef before we draw any conclusions about how the world works and plus we should always um think critically about those conclusions what we want to see are our studies that are well replicated those are robust yeah. findings in different populations with slightly different methods not just one or two studies that uses a very you know narrow range of methods so the file drawer effect is what happened to me with that um study on pornography and testosterone i never published it because it didn't work like it didn't show that this manipulation changed testosterone levels so there's no study out there showing don't do what she did and try to manipulate testosterone levels with pornography because it doesn't do anything because who's going to want to publish that mm -hmm. yeah. so we don't so what but what we see are the positive results the interesting results yeah. so that's the file drawer effect i just put it away no that's fast that's like when yeah. we see those articles that say compound in chocolate burns fat you know right yeah, yeah, it's uh, like, yeah. then you got to read all the other studies that show yeah, eating chocolate actually makes, makes you gain body fat so. <laughs> uh carol again one of my favorite guests really thank appreciate you so much. talking to you thank you so much for what you do um and thank you for writing this book great i hope you bet Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out all of our free guides and free information. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.